this is not the usual crowd that I give uh, talks to, but I'm very happy to be here. Uh, you may be wondering what a quantum physicist is doing here. Kim just said that you know I will teach you how to defy gravity using quantum physics. I will probably not do that uh, in 15 minutes anyways, but what I will try to do is give you a little bit of background into the life of someone who tried to solve an impossible problem. Right? Um, my research right now is indeed in quantum gravity, what is called the theory of everything. I do try to understand the foundations of reality at the level where space and time no longer exist, right? You know, because if gravity, according to Einstein, is the curvature of space-time, what better place to go and like foil his plans by, by understanding space-time itself, right? Seeing where space and time come from. And if I were to ask you maybe, you know, 20 minutes ago, if you thought that space and time come from something else, you would probably say no, right? You would say those are fundamental. They are the canvas upon which we draw the laws of physics and our experiences and everything. But I want to do something else. I want to tell you a little bit about what happened about eight years ago. It was August 17th, 2009. It was a Monday. I will never forget that day. Um, first of all, it is my father's birthday, so my mom had called me that morning just to remind me, as she always does, that I should call them back and pretend that I had not forgotten that it was my dad's birthday. Uh, but she was telling me because of the time difference uh, with Greece, where I grew up, and where my parents still live, they had already done a bunch of things during the day, and she was just telling me about this 20 course meal she was putting together for a few friends and family, right, you know, to celebrate. But as she was talking to me, I interrupted her and I said, You know, Mom, I don't know if I want to wake up tomorrow. And that was not something she had ever heard from me before. Right? I had done well in life. I was a valedictorian growing up. Like I went to MIT for my undergraduate degree. My two brothers also went to MIT, like, you know, all from Greece and all that stuff. We're successful people. We're doing well, right? And for her to hear something like that from her son for the first time, I think it stunned her. So what had happened, right? I had actually, for the first time, faced an opponent that was way beyond my abilities. So much so that I had hit a wall, right? I heard earlier that there are some runners here, and I know that you know when you run a marathon, maybe the first time you hit a wall, where that wall felt impossibly high. But at the same time, though, I felt that I had trained all my life right, to fight this fight, and I was knocked down within three seconds of entering the ring, right? I was actually trying to solve one of the hardest problems in quantum physics. So let me take you back a year earlier, right? That's closer to October of 2008. I had just finished my PhD at UC Davis. It was in applied mathematics with some you know, background in quantum physics. And I was fortunate enough to move to Los Alamos National Lab, where I was working with one of the most brilliant physicists, I think, of all time. He's currently at Microsoft Research, and he is building a quantum computer. Um, but it was incredible that he even decided to take a student. And I was a postdoc, right? Not a graduate student. I was a postdoc. But in his eyes, I was still a student. And I was. So when I arrived there, he actually asked me, would you like to work on something kind of cute, you know, to get you warmed up, right? You just got your PhD. Or would you like to work on something interesting? And I said, well, I mean, I'd like to work on something interesting. And then later that day, he sent me an email with a link to this page. Now, I venture no one has ever been on that page. <laughs> This is the page that contains what are called the millennium problems in mathematical physics. If you actually can, I don't know if you can see, but towards the bottom right here, you see Bose-Einstein condensation. That problem, partial progress towards that problem, won the Nobel Prize for 2001. Then there is Navier-Stokes, which you may have heard of. It's a millennium problem, clay mathematics, with a million dollar prize around it. Try to understand how fluids work. And then there is this 
third problem here, the one that actually said solve next to it, that's the view I had, by the way, when I looked at that page for the first time. That problem here got the people that actually solved partially whatever this problem is about, a Fields Medal in 2006 and another one in 2010 for work on this problem. Now, how many of you know what a Fields Medal is? Oh, that's cool, it's a, a good crowd. So a Fields Medal is like the Nobel Prize, but you only get it every four years, right? So it's about four times as hard to get, and it's only about mathematics because, you know, we never really get to, as mathematicians, enjoy a Nobel Prize because it's what we do is kind of useless. So, you know. <laughs> um, so we developed our own prize, you know, to say one up them. Also, you have to be under 40 years old at the time of the research that gets you the prize to actually get the prize. So even harder, right? And so I was supposed to solve number two. That was the interesting problem I had to solve. Right? Um, so what is the quantum hole conductance, right? Does anyone know what that is? Good. You will feel bad later on because, you know, <laughs> well, you'll see. So this is what it says when you click on that link, right? It says, formulate the theory of the integer quantum hole effect, which explains the quantization of the hole conductance, so that it applies also for interacting electrons in the thermodynamic limit without the averaging assumption. All right, so raise your hand if this makes any sense to you. <laughs> That's amazing, somebody actually raised their hand. We should talk later. Um, well, the interesting thing is that I was exactly in your position when I first laid out on this. I could not understand a single word, right? Okay, I had seen quantum before. But again, I was a mathematician, trained a little bit with like a physics background. I didn't even know myself what the problem was about. Okay, so what is this problem? By the way, these names of Yoshi Avron and Rudy Zeiler, they're the two mathematical physicists, very famous. Again, I'm sure you don't know them, but it's okay. That had actually submitted this problem as one of the millennium problems. In fact, this list, if you remember like from before, was from 98 to 99. They came together, they had one of these like Hilbert moments where they decided this will be the list for the next century, right? You know, we'll try to solve these problems. And they said these are the 13 problems. Okay, so what is the integer quantum Hall effect? All right, here's a crash course. So imagine that you have a two-dimensional metal, right? And you will apply, a, oh, I'm sorry. You will apply a magnetic field in this Z direction we call transversal to this two-dimensional foil. And then you will apply also an electric field, just electricity running in this X direction. Now what had Edwin Hall had actually seen about 130 years ago, and by the way, his professor was Maxwell, so they were working on electricity at the time without knowing what the electrons were. He said to, to Maxwell, I think you've made a mistake in your textbook but Maxwell didn't take this very well and said, like, you know, prove me wrong, right? It was a big deal back then. He said, okay, so he did this experiment and showed that this electric field was actually being diverted, as we now know, because of the magnetic force that these electrons were feeling along this direction. And we call this the whole conductance. Instead of getting conductance of electrons this way, you started seeing some non-zero conductance this way. So fast forward 100 years to 1980. And what you have is this man here, Klaus von Klitzen, who won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1985 for showing that if you were to reduce the temperature and increase the magnetic field strength, doing exactly the same thing pretty much as Hall had done 100 years before him, then you would get to see something interesting. I know it says again that there is like a, another Nobel Prize, right? And it's also true, it's for the same problem, for doing partial work on this as well. He said that you would be able to see, let me see here, I had this like, you'd be able to see this stepwise conductance. This is the resistance, meaning that as you're increasing the magnetic field strength, you wouldn't just have this linear conductance, right? It wouldn't just go linearly up as everybody expected. 
No, this was a quantum effect. They started seeing plateaus, and this made no sense to, to anyone. And in fact, these plateaus were in integer multiples of fundamental constants of nature, right? The electron charge squared divided by the Planck's constant. It was insane. So after he did that, some other people later on did an even stronger magnetic field with lower temperature. They also got the Nobel Prize for seeing that you could also get fractions, meaning you could even see fractions of an electron. Now, most of you think of an electron as being a fundamental particle, right? Wrong. It is not a fundamental particle. And they got the, the Nobel Prize in 98 for actually looking at this. But the interesting thing is that this man here, Robert Lothlin, who is still a professor here at Stanford, he was able to predict the behavior. He was the first one to actually explain in some way how this worked. <coughs> and he got the Nobel Prize even though he was a mathematician. Well, I would call him a mathematician. He would kill me. He, he thinks he's a physicist for theoretical work. He got the Nobel Prize for theoretical work. And this the gentleman here confirmed it. Again, for the quantum Hall effect, what was called the fractional quantum Hall effect. OK. So I was opposed to outdo all of them, right? They had made partial progress to figuring out that problem. That's why the problem was still up there as a millennium problem. So my advisor said, OK, this is what you're going to do, right? You're going to read this book and then solve it. I mean, literally, that was it. Right? He, didn't, he, he left. He, was, he became so famous like instantly because of some other stuff that MIT, Harvard, Caltech, uh, Google, IBM, like everyone wanted him. So he was never there, right? I was just left to my own devices. <coughs> so I read that book, but as you will see, it didn't help very much. So this is the timeline of progress to the next year. I received the book. His name is Matt Hastings. I formulated the question about four months later that I need to answer. I formulated the question. I wasn't making progress. I just understood finally what the question should be. Okay? It was, it was wonderful. In May of 2009, I also understood why it was such a difficult problem. Okay. Which is amazing, actually, I think. It, was, it didn't take me that long. Um, then I had a good idea. I remember it was June 12th, I wrote it down. <laughs> I had a good idea. I finally started getting like, an idea of why the others had failed before. Remember, he said something about in the interacting case without the averaging assumption, right? It turned out that these people had gotten Nobel Prizes for doing the wrong thing, right? Like, they were getting the right answer because they were doing two things that were wrong in succession, two negatives were making a positive. And nobody else could reproduce this by removing one of the false assumptions they were making because the whole structure was falling apart. So the good idea I had was like to use their idea, but then extend it and try to do something that we now call holographic theory, to try to understand the bulk of an object by looking at the boundary and understanding something which is much simpler at the boundary and all the complexity in the box just goes away, which also relates to gravity these days. OK. So I actually thought I solved the problem. July 4th, it was my Independence Day, right? And I did call everyone I knew, because also it was very lonely up there in uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. I don't know if you've ever visited. Don't, you know? It's just <laughs> <coughs> Anyways. So moving forward, the next day, right, I woke up sweating because I figured out that I had made a mistake. It was amazing. It took me only a night of non-sleeping to realize that there was a minus sign problem, right? And that it was a fatal mistake. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'll patch this up. It felt like I had done no progress, right? No progress. <laughs> Very true. I really thought I fixed the mistake. I call everyone again. It was an amazing feeling. A week later. It took me a week this time to figure out because it was a deeper mistake. That's when I told my mom, I don't know if I want to wake up tomorrow. 
right? It was a whole year almost by that point where I had done nothing but work on this problem in like complete isolation up in Los Alamos. Do not visit. <laughs> okay, so the next morning, I get an email from Matt, probably because I probably also sent him an email saying like, you know, this sucks, I don't want to do this anymore. He's like, you can do this. <laughs> that was it, right? Thank you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Surprisingly, that works for me, right? So about two months later, I send my proof to Matt. You're suspecting now what will happen, right? Nevertheless, I had actually solved the problem. I had actually solved the problem, right? And it took him four days, because he's a genius, right, you know, to figure out that I had actually solved the problem. And I also called my mom again, you know. But I didn't say, like, I solved the problem. I said, like, I think there's a really good chance. And also, Matt thinks that I did it, but don't tell anyone else, right? <laughs> it was not working very well by that. So about a month later, I submitted the proof of publication because well, I'm a scientist, that's what we need to do, right? And two years later, I hear back from referee number four. <laughs> this is for real. I copied it from, right? The proof is too technical. Why aren't the authors using Laughlin's argument, the guy who won the Nobel Prize, for almost figuring out how it worked? They should rewrite it and submit for further review, OK? You suck, but OK, you know? Three years later, after that, not after the solution, okay? I worked on it, I revised it, I cut down the proof to half, which was still 30 pages long, and it should have been more like 150 pages to understand, but it's okay, you know? That's what we do to, for revenge to the referees. Um, referee number 12. Usually, if you've ever published anything, it takes about two referees to decide if you're gonna be published or not. There were 12 referees, actually, with the original four, so 16 in total. He had gone to everyone around the world who could understand this, and nobody could really understand the proof. It's just they ended up talking to each other in like a puzzle that they decided, okay, this guy like, you know, did it, even though we, you know, we can't, none of us can actually verify or understand the whole thing, all right? So again, the laughing argument, damn it, <laughs> you know? And then anyways, I recommend it for publication. And I felt this was like the best day of my life. And this is what it looked like. The quantization of the whole conductance for interacting electrons on a torus. It's the sexiest title of any research publication ever. And again, if you were to read later on, it says like down here something about without the additional topological order assumption, blah, blah, blah. so what was it like? We don't have. Yeah, without the averaging assumption, that was the key. And we were also doing interactions and we were doing everything. Anyway, so as I said, his argument was right for the wrong reasons. And that's why everybody was having trouble. But I thought after like, I published it and everything that maybe nobody cared about this problem anymore. And then eight months ago, the Nobel Physics Prize Committee decided that the guy who had written that stupid book should get the Nobel Prize for making some progress on that problem. Right? So, I don't know, there's been seven Nobel Prizes so far, right? But I want to leave you with this. That when you're faced with an insurmountable obstacle, the best way to overcome it is to start digging at the foundations. You have to go under, not above, like you're flying upside down, right? If you don't go to the foundations, you'll never be able to outdo the ones that came before you. Pay tribute to them but go underneath. Anyways, I just want to leave you with this, right? Six days ago, I got an email from Yossi. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>